Tornadoes are one of the most destructive forces on Earth. Ranging in size and wind speeds between 65 to over 200 miles per hour, these powerful storms leave death and devastation in their wake. On May 31, 2013, the widest tornado ever recorded hit the city of El Reno, Oklahoma, killing multiple people. Four of the victims were storm chasers, the first known deaths in the history of storm chasing. The tornado also set the record for the second highest wind speeds ever recorded, with winds exceeding 295 miles per hour. The tornado was created by an immense storm known as a supercell. Supercells are monstrous thunderstorms with clouds that can reach an altitude of up to 70,000 feet above ground. They're distinguishable by their large cloud rotation, caused by the combination of wind shear, and consistent strong updrafts of wind, which form what's known as a mesocyclone. When the warm air from the updraft meets the cool moist air of the storm's downdraft, it forms a rotating wall cloud which begins to lower, the beginning stages of a tornado. Supercells may be large or small, and can appear many places around the world, but they're mostly found within the central states of the U.S. in a section known as Tornado Alley. Supercells are rare amongst storms. They are known to produce large hail, heavy rain that can cause flooding, as well as damaging winds and tornadoes. Only 10 to 20 percent of supercells produce tornadoes. Only 5 percent of these tornadoes are considered an EF3 rating on the enhanced Fujita scale and less than 1% are given an EF4 or higher rating. Tornadoes can last from several seconds to over an hour, but most don't exceed 10 minutes. In the United States, the average tornado is about 500 feet across and travels on the ground for around 5 miles. The tornado produced in El Reno on May 31, 2013 lasted 40 minutes, traveled 16.2 miles at speeds of up to 55 miles per hour, and reached a whopping 2.6 miles wide at its peak, 0.3 miles wider than Manhattan. Just a few hours from the storm, skies were still blue. Around 5.30 p.m., air sirens gave warning of the approaching tornado. At 6.02 p.m., the first funnel touched the ground. This was a multiple vortex tornado, which means the storm produces many twisters called subvortices that circle in and around the main vortex. Shortly after the tornado began, a group of subvortices merged together into a much larger tornado known as a wedge. A wedge is when a tornado grows as wide as it is tall or larger. More subvortices then started circling the wedge like some hellish carousel. In Oklahoma, tornadoes typically head northeast, but the El Reno tornado started off heading southeast. Most big tornadoes cut a path that's hundreds of yards wide. Seven minutes in, the El Reno tornado was already a mile wide at its base and growing. The tornado's erratic behavior and increasing power resulted in many storm chasers scrambling to evade the twister's path. This was made much more difficult due to the tornado being shrouded in rain. When this happens, it can be near impossible to see a tornado with the naked eye unless it is dangerously close to you. Many storm chasers did not realize the size of the tornado and got caught within the outer area affected by the twister, which contained deadly debris and winds exceeding 120 miles per hour. Winds at these speeds push and pull on moving vehicles, causing them to lose speed and control. Around 20 minutes after touching ground, the tornado had grown to 2 miles wide and was heading northeast at about 55 miles per hour towards Highway 81. A group of storm chasers from the History Channel were heading south on 81 in an attempt to get out of its way when they were hit by one of the storm's powerful sub-vortices. The powerful wind soon knocked their vehicles off the road and caused one of their SUVs to take off like an aircraft before it veered left and rolled into a field hundreds of yards from the road. Three passengers were in the SUV at the time, but luckily, nobody from the History Channel team was killed. At the same time, Another group of storm chasers known as the Twist X team were traveling with the tornado near its northern edge. The group was led by Tim Samaris, a storm chasing expert known for his time on the Discovery Channel show Storm Chasers. Tim Samaris was the first person to deploy instruments that measure what happens inside of a tornado. He engineered circular pods that record wind speeds and barometric pressure. To successfully test the pods, 
Samaris would have to place them in the path of a tornado. A risky job, but many say that Tim Samaris was not a thrill seeker and would be the first to pull out if the situation looked too dangerous. His son, photographer Paul Samaris, and meteorologist Carl Young were also part of the Twist X team. The three had originally planned to cut the tornado off at Highway 81 so they could deploy their pods, but the tornado was already passing over 81 by the time they reached it. They continued heading east on Reuter Road, but two miles in, they were struck and killed by one of the tornado's subvortices. A video camera in the car recorded the entire event, but the footage was not released to the public. However, a description of the events was given by a fellow storm chaser who viewed the footage. As Twist X headed down Reuter Road, east of Highway 81, they were hit with sudden heavy rain that made it difficult to see, and high winds that almost caused the car to swerve off the road. Suddenly, the rain stopped and there was an eerie calm. Carl Young could then be heard saying, There's no rain around here. To which Tim Samaris replied, Actually, I think we're in a bad spot. The video footage then cut out. Over their radio, Highway Patrol could hear Tim and Paul Samaris shouting, We're going to die, we're going to die. Reports say the subvortex made a sudden change in direction and headed straight for their car. After arriving at their location, the vortex stopped and remained in place for 20 seconds. Some say it was as if the tornado lunged out at them on purpose. This is what their car looked like after being hit by the tornado. Tim Samaris was found in the passenger seat of the car with his seatbelt still on. Paul Samaris and Carl Young were sucked out of the vehicle by the powerful subvortex, and their bodies were found half a mile away from the car near the road. The subvortices in this tornado traveled at speeds up to 180 miles per hour. They were as wide as football fields at their base and contained wind speeds over 250 miles per hour. Wind strong enough to throw a 2009 Chevy Cobalt into a field half a mile away. As the tornado passed over the Twist X team, it had reached its peak size and intensity. By 6.27 p.m., the tornado was heading towards Interstate Highway 40, where it made a loop just north of the interstate and began decelerating to less than 10 miles per hour. Just past 6.35 p.m., the tornado began moving east and dissipated at 6.42 p.m. near the intersection of I-40 and Banner Road. At that time, multiple freeways including Interstate 40 were packed bumper to bumper by cars filled with terrified citizens trying to escape the tornado. If the tornado had kept its strength and continued its path onto Interstate 40, experts say the death toll could have easily reached 500 or more. During its lifespan, the storm also created baseball-sized hail and another rare tornado called a satellite tornado. Satellite tornadoes are a separate tornado that travel around the original vortex in an orbit-like fashion. Scientists do not know much about these tornadoes, but they do know that satellite tornadoes usually only appear in severe tornadoes. This is a picture taken by Richard Charles Henderson 10 minutes before the same tornado took his life. The photo was taken on Henderson's cell phone and sent to his friend, George Slay. Slay told the media that he had been talking with Henderson on the phone while his friend chased the storm in his pickup truck. Slay told Henderson, You better quit that. But Henderson ignored his friend's warnings and continued to chase the tornado. Ten minutes after sending the picture, a loud popping sound could be heard over the phone as Henderson explained that his truck was being hit with debris. Slay replied, you better get your ass out of there. Then the phone went dead. Henderson's parents said he was thrown from the pickup truck. They said the inside of the truck was just as clean as if it had come off the showroom. They said everything was out of it, so it must have sucked him and everything else out of it, Henderson's mother said. Another victim of the storm was a man named Dustin Bridges, who was driving with a co-worker on or near Interstate 40 when they ended up right in the path of the tornado. Dustin was 32 at the time of his death. The co-worker survived. According to police chief Eddie Dickerson, a car carrying two unidentified men was said to be caught in the tornado's path. One man died at the scene, and the other was reported to have died later while in the hospital. 
Oklahoma Highway Patrol reported that multiple troopers witnessed an SUV carrying a family of five being sucked into the tornado on Interstate 40. The mother and the baby did not survive, but the father and two other children did. The next day, flooding caused by the storm was said to take the lives of three more people, including an unidentified four-year-old boy. Despite its size and the wind speeds that went well over an EF5 rating, the El Reno tornado was dropped down to an EF3 due to the amount of damage it caused.